Welcome to Vertical City. I'm your host, Lennon Richardson. During each episode, I interview one of the world's top experts in architecture, urban design, engineering, or ecology, so that we can better understand and develop solutions for sustainable living. Thank you for listening, and get ready to join us on another groundbreaking and uplifting episode. Kellogg Wong was born in Rosedale, Mississippi in 1928, a year before the Great Depression. At the age of five, he and his two siblings were sent to Nanjing, China for a better life and education as the Chinese were not allowed to attend the all-white public schools in segregated Mississippi. In 1937, Kellogg returned to the United States after Japan invaded China. He then earned a Bachelor's of Architecture degree from Georgia Institute of Technology, briefly served as a commander in the military, practiced architecture in Houston, and got a Master's of Architecture degree from Cranebrook Academy of Art. He then moved to New York, where he worked with I.M. Pei on many of his most iconic projects for about 40 years. Shortly after retirement, Kellogg partnered with Ken King to co-author the book, Vertical City, A Solution for Sustainable Living. In this interview, we discuss Kellogg's work in education in the I.M. Pei office, the development of the Vertical City concept, including some of the remaining unanswered questions and concerns, and what his hopes for humanity are considering sustainability and urbanization. More information about Kellogg Wong and everything we discussed in this interview can be found by visiting verticalcity.org slash podcast. So, Kellogg, welcome to the Vertical City Podcast. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm glad you're here. Um, my first question for you, you've practiced architecture for over 40 years. I wonder what some of the biggest changes that have taken place in the industry are from when you started until when you retired. Well, my professors at Georgia Tech were from the Bauhaus era. And while I was in school, even when I started practicing architecture, uh, there were the three giants of architecture, uh, lucky for me. Uh, each representing very different schools of design. There was Frank Lloyd Wright of the Prairie School, um, Lise Van der Rohe, the Minimalist, and Le Corbusier, uh, whose brush was concrete. Mm. So one had a difficult choice of deciding of which school to follow. And there were, of course, uh, Saarinen, Lucan, uh, Bunshaft, uh, Meyer, Breuer, and Stern, and, of course, I.M. Pei. Uh, uh, luckily, I had a crash course uh, in in the production of working drawings uh, at my first job in Houston, Texas, uh, which served me well later on uh, in the pay office. The prevalent uh, construction material in those early days, aside from the familiar wood frame, which was more suitable for small-scale buildings or for mid-sized structures, but for larger scale or high-rise projects, the favorite material was structural steel and the perfection of the usage of which uh, came from the hands of Mies van der Rohe. Uh, the linear nature of material, generally all straight pieces, uh, whether it's a two-by-four wood stud or a wide flange of steel beam, uh, were all straight, and their application uh, in the construction process uh, resulted in mostly rectilinear buildings with right-angle corners and flat roofs. Uh, with the introduction of architecture concrete, uh, which was already widely used in Europe because of the scarcity of steel there uh, in the mid-50s in the, uh, in the United States. The pay firm being uh, the U.S. vanguard and perfection of its application uh, not only integrated the building structural uh, enclosure and fenestration, but offered a more plastic building material whose application resulted in freer forms uh, of architectural sculptural expression, uh, freedom from the box, so to speak. Then, of course, there was the introduction of uh, the computer-aided design, or CAD, mm-hmm. uh, which came in the early ni- 1990s, and that changed everything, not only the design process, but also uh, the construction of heretofore impossible to dimension complex forms and com- complicated structures. It freed the imagination, and architects became sculptors. And then you have the movement of uh, the sustainability, or the, or the green movement, uh, which is the byword um, 
of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, and is the most influential factor in the writing of our book. Then, uh, after 9-11, uh, 2001, and which and continuing to today, concerns for the security of life and property from attacks both domestic and foreign forever changed the climate of innocence within the world of the United States forever. Yeah. So those, in my, from my recollection, or the, the major changes um, during my practice. Okay. I think that sounds like a really nice summary you've just given. Uh, from all those different elements you listed, architecture moving from more of just a science to an art and a science, and then the sustainability movement and the concern over safety. Were any of those more surprising to you than others? Was there something that really shocked you that came about over those 40 years? Well, not shocking. Uh, some of it you could already see. Uh, being a person who was raised in the countryside and uh, a lover of nature, uh, I, I could see that over fertilization, chemicals were actually polluting the stream. One of my favorite trout streams, for instance, here in Connecticut, uh, you can fish, but you can't eat the fish. Oh, wow. Like a, a discharge of mercury uh, by a uh, plant upstream just made it impossible uh, to get rid of. As a matter of fact, you can't disturb it. You have to allow it to just uh, uh, remain at the bottom of the stream. If you try to remove it, which is very costly, you would then pollute further uh, uh, downstream. I see. Uh, so I, I was, uh, it was overdue in, 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 in my view, but uh, the word sustainability, of course, was a new one to me. Mm -hmm. uh, security, uh, of course, was kind of a shocker. Uh, I was working on the United Nations refurbishment project at the time, and overnight, the, the, the whole policy of having security but unseen and appear friendly uh, at the United Nations change overnight to one where they want you to, to notice that there were armed guards uh, stationed at every uh, at every corner. Oh, okay. So a majority of your career was spent uh, with I.M. Payne in his office. What were some of the biggest takeaways or the biggest learning experiences you had from working so closely with I.M. Payne for so many years? Well, the most important one was that the that architecture style was, was superficial that architecture that can stand the test of time must have the classical properties of nobility, presence, spatial experience, experiences, concern for materials and the details, respect for its use, and a timeless quality that will render the building relevant for years to come, uh, regardless of the ever-changing, uh, trendy, stylistic taste of the day. Uh, also, that architecture is more than an individual building on, the, on an isolated lot. Instead, that the architectural solution uh, is rooted in the particular location of the site, uh, the particularities of the site, its relationship to its neighbors, uh, is important to the city or town with, within which it was located, and even in its history. So the results of building produced uh, uh, by that office some of which I worked on uh, years ago, when seen today after 40 or 50 years, still justify the appraisal comments of the critics as, you know, it's still a very good building. That's good. How do you feel the industry does in both of those regards currently, um, considering the surroundings and creating things that are timeless? Well, architects generally are, are the timeliness of architecture. Yeah, in, uh, in well, general. You, you, the best example to me would be in China, uh, where no one paid too much attention, including the Chinese themselves, uh, to their history. Okay. Uh, it's almost impossible these days. Uh, one of the one of the concerns that Mr. Pei has and and tried to um, teach to the fellow Chinese was that you shouldn't just go about copying what's happening in the West, but rather uh, draw inspiration from your past. Well, my philosophy is that that was possible in the old days uh, when all it took was a river or a, a, a range of mountains, uh, of course the ocean, to separate you from the neighbors. And therefore you were inclined or almost forced to uh, reach within yourself uh, to change things very slowly, uh, never forgetting the past. But these days, uh, you know, with television being what it is and movies being what it is and traveling being what it is, it's very, very difficult to, to try to impose that kind of a 
uh, guidance on, on, on young architects. Mm. And so what you see uh, is an architectural, uh, international architectural style. I, I think a lot of damage was done uh, to China in the early days. Uh, if you look across the river from the Bun in Shanghai, that's what's happening on the island, there's no, no consistency. All you see is a, it's a jungle of building, each one trying to outdo the others, so very acrobatic, uh, demanded, by the way, by the clients themselves who want it to be different, bigger, or taller. Sure. Uh, so that, unfortunately, is the, is, is the trend. But you still have concerned architects, uh, uh, no matter where they are, they're trying to do the correct thing, more indigenous to the site. And I, I dare say that among them would be Mr. Pay's sons, uh-huh. uh, to, to, to Pay brothers, uh, Didi and Sandy, are trying very hard in their projects in China to, to impose a discipline that they learned from their father. All right, great. So okay. mm-hmm. after working for over 40 years as an architect, you retired, and then Ken Keen came to you and, and came to you with this idea of writing a book about vertical cities. What did you think when he approached you? Did you think that the book and the concept was going to turn out to be as big as it has? Uh, actually, I'm giving some thought to this, and I, I, I'm, I, I think that the word is not big, but uh, untried or different. Okay. Uh, my my first thought when when uh, he mentioned uh, a, a super tall building was that in most vertical cities uh, that are driven by market forces, um, some would say that that's probably the more realistic force. Uh, the greatest financial return uh, for a super tall building would be in the form of mixed use building, and there's a reason for it uh, because the, the lower floors which is devoted to retail, would fetch the highest rent. Uh, all you need to do is look at the streets of New York and any city. The ground floor are generally uh, devoted to shops, uh, boutiques and, and, and such. Right. They're easier to access. Uh, right. And then uh, on the, the next level up would be the professional office spaces, you know, for doctors and dentists, uh, uh, psychiatrists, uh, that also would, would pay uh, good rent. And that would be followed by corporate office spaces. Uh, and then some high-end hotels, uh, which has very high operational overhead, uh, perhaps augmented by uh, service apartments. And then finally, the apartments, to, in order to fill the building, uh, which fetch the, the, the least amount of rent. And of course, uh, on the topmost floor, the tourist uh, attraction of the observation floor, uh, and perhaps with a revolving restaurant. Uh, also, the race to claim the title of the tallest building was real to all of us who uh, lived and worked in, in New York, in Manhattan, where the Empire State Building, you know, held court until the World Trade Twin Towers had the audacity to try to take over some 40 years later. And after that, the race was on. Okay. And it was won, won by the Sears Tower in Chicago, and then the Petronas Tower in Malaysia, uh, the Taipei 101 and the Burj Khalifa, uh, so far one of the tallest buildings in the world. So it seems that every time we turn around, um, there'll be another tall building. So at the conference uh, that Janet and and Ken and I attended um, at the beginning of the whole process of writing the book in in 2011, uh, Burj Khalifa was a talk of the town, uh, with attendees hinting at already working on a one-kilometer-high building. And therefore, for the sheer drama of it all, and in honor of uh, the American architect Frank Lloyd Wright, who uh, first proposed a, a model high building, uh, we decided to make his dream come true by sticking out a model high building as our goal. Okay. And also, prior to attending the conference, I was aware that the pay partnership, uh, which I think you uh, indicated in the film itself, uh, was working on a building that allegedly was be the tallest uh, in the Middle East and therefore the tallest in the world. Uh, at, but long about that time, I was also in charge of the Bank of China Tower in Hong Kong, uh, which at 70 stories, uh, was the sixth tallest building at the, upon its completion in 1982. So working on the a Bank of China and other high rise buildings, uh, in the pay office, where a one million square foot building was our bread and butter, uh, the science of, of elevating, elevatoring, including the yet 
uh, to be operational ropeless elevators uh, with as far stairs and toilets and mechanical rooms, which together formed the core of, uh, of, of all high-rise buildings. It was essential that its design be efficient uh, in order to increase the uh, natural growth index, uh, which was demanded by the highly competitive uh, uh, real estate market. Similarly, the issues of the foundations, uh, wind, earthquake factors, mechanical service, the high-rise buildings were all uh, familiar to me. Therefore, uh, to me, uh, the hard science of a tall building, even at a mile-high one, was only a matter of the application of known uh, technologies. What was new was to find a building brief, uh, a program, or an owner, for instance, uh, one that was driven, uh, say, by the decree of government, governmental policy and not by market forces that would support such a tall building. Okay. Fast-growing China had such needs. Yeah. And thus was the birth of what we call the purely bedroom, uh, 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 which is typical to suburbs, a bedroom uh, uh, vertical city, uh, with employment providing elsewhere, and then by extension, uh, which is a natural outgrowth, uh, a larger, what we call a live-work vertical city, which I will describe later. Okay. So the, the correct word in your questions I said early on, uh, with, with not that it was, became such a big issue, but rather a new or untried issue. Okay. So would you like to describe the live-work community now, or is that something you're planning on addressing later yeah. for our audience? Uh, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I can do, describe it later. Okay. All right. That's fair enough. So it sounds like you started off with um, this goal of just creating a structure that was super tall, but as you began to interview experts from different fields, it seems as if maybe the project grew or merged into something different. Is that an accurate statement? Uh, somewhat, somewhat. I, I, I think that the majority of, of the book was devoted to uh, interview of experts. Uh, we actually said in the preface that we were not experts and, and that our effort was not necessarily to find a solution, uh, but to uh, be provocative in, in raising issues that we thought you know, others can contribute, can contribute to. Uh, what was not surprising, uh, when we interview our fellow architects and city planners and educators, uh, was that the joint realization and appreciation of the need, uh, for the world to change its unsustainable habits of living and building. And each one of them within their, the limits of their own individual disciplines through experimentations uh, with new building design systems or technologies, we're trying to add their voices to the message to society to discard their old habits uh, for ones that are more earth friendly. Yeah. But what was surprising was that they all echo the lament that was like whistling in the dark with no one listening. Oh, wow. Uh, that, that, uh, I, I found uh, really quite disturbing. I mean, here you have, uh, people whose livelihood depends on designing and building and teaching uh, about architecture uh, and, and construction, uh, knowing full well that we're heading down the wrong path and trying to convince people to do like uh, otherwise, but it seems that no one was listening. Wow. So having interviewed experts from so many different fields, what were some of the um, key things that you learned? You almost have to go into the book and read uh but the disciplines of, of each of them, because we interview uh, educators, uh, people in the uh, elevating field, uh, a lot of designers and city planners. Um, they each have their own point of view as to how to go about uh, designing sustainable building, including making use of the facade of buildings uh, for the growing of food, uh, including uh, indoor farming uh, and, and all of those things. So together, uh, one day they, they maybe would be all tested on, on an actual a vertical building, a vertical city. And how about the sky lobbies? Was that something that you guys had in mind initially, or was that something that emerged through the interviews? A sky lobby is a term that uh, uh, 
been used for quite a while. Generally, it simply means a transfer from one bank of elevators to the other. Okay. Uh, one of the constraints of going higher than the hundred and some odd stories is the fact that elevating, uh, as as the, the size of elevating as it, ex- now, ex- as it exists now, uh, requires a cable or what they call it, loosely referred to as a rope. Sure. And the taller the 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 the, the floors to be served, the longer the rope, uh, to a point that the weight of the rope. Uh, becomes the 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 major uh, element to be handled by the by the motors, and you could have long long ropes that you would end up with gigantic motors. Uh, if you were to visit the uh, the, the 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 museum of um, the World Trade Center, uh, they have display one of those elevator motors, and it's almost the size of a car. Wow! So there's a limit as to how high rope elevators can go, uh, which means then you take it as high as you can and make a transfer onto another bank of elevators. It's been uh, decided through through a careful studies, uh, and, and we ourselves know that, that you would accept one transfer. And if you have to make another transfer, it becomes very distracting and disturbing, and, and uh, very soon you grow up very impatient. So the sky lobby as a term uh, has existed. Uh, as it applies uh, to the uh, vertical city, we use that transportation hub to create an elevated city center. Uh, there you would have shops uh, conveniently located, as you would have in any village square, a small shopping center uh, with perhaps even libraries, um, uh, health uh, g- gymnasium, and so forth. So that the, the residents in the towers do not have to go all the way down to the ground floor. Their day-to-day requirements uh, for food and, and even clothing uh, could be handled at the uh, at these sky lobbies. But the vertical city model takes it even farther, though, doesn't it? Because it's not only a place for indoor spaces and a, a place to transfer um, to different elevators, but it's also a means of transferring to different buildings, and it also provides outdoor spaces. Uh, actually, by by extension, you would like to be able to interconnect the towers. Mm-hmm. And so there would be bridges from one uh, sky lobby to the other, which would also help to brace the building uh, against the wind forces. Now, one has to be careful as to uh, how a delicate balance between the spacing of the buildings from each other in order to protect the, to protect the view of one building to the other. Uh, but soon enough, though, if you're not careful, those interconnecting pathways become burdens to the, to the buildings because uh, if they're too long, then the, the buildings themselves just become support for the bridge. I see. Uh, rather than the bridge supporting the building. So there's a delicate balance. Uh, secondarily, uh, ha- uh, uh, history will tell you that maintenance on on these kinds of bridges, connectors, generally are, 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 are badly needed and soon become unusable if, if they're not kept police and safe. Uh, and at, when you get up to the higher levels, you have to also be careful about the wind uh, because uh, I know that in, I understand from, from some tall buildings, that an automatic alarm system would lock all of the uh, the windows and doors because otherwise you uh, the high winds would just blow all your possessions out the window. Okay. Uh, so it, it's a it's a a a uh, an element that you want to take advantage of to be outdoors and so forth, but you do have to have a, a delicate balance as to how far apart, how long those bridges are. So this idea of the sky bridges seems. Like it makes a lot of sense because it's giving people the opportunity to transfer between buildings without having to go to the ground floor. And it's also providing, as you said, a, a village center for people to fulfill their common day-to-day needs. But this seems like it hasn't really been used very much in current applications. I know that there's a couple of tall towers in Singapore that are connected by a sky bridge. And there's a few other examples. But is there any reason you feel that this hasn't become uh, more implemented into the architectural practice. Well, you know, we, we have we have ideas about circulation pathways, 
um, think about this a little bit. Who would be using the bridges uh, and for, for what purpose unless you have a reason to use them? For instance, uh, even today, uh, I live in a condominium. So for me to go from one spot to the other, uh, it has to be for a reason. So if you have relatives or friends that live next door and you want to go visit them, and you would take the sky bridge. Uh, or if you want to go out for a breath of fresh air, you would have the sky bridge. Uh, if I look out of my window onto my street system, which is very pedestrian friendly because there are very few cars, you see very few people using them. Now, I must say that in a very highly congested uh, building such as a, a vertical city, uh, you may find the need for this kind of an outlet. So, what I am imagining would be would be all wrong. There may be a lot of usage, uh, and at least we we have the responsibility of of offering the residents, you know, that possibility of uh, of traveling horizontally, uh, because I I think that's one of the things you're going to miss if you live in your isolated apartment and most of your circulation is up and down. Uh, you, you'd be very anxious to be able to travel horizontally, whether you go all the way down to the ground or take advantage of the uh, of the sky bridges. Okay. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. The way our societies are currently constructed, you live in one place and you typically work in a place that's quite far away and your friends are also in distances that are quite far away. So it doesn't really make sense in the way our cities are currently developed to interconnect our buildings. But in a more vertical city, then it would make sense because everything you need to do in your day-to-day life is right there in your tower and the adjacent towers. Right, right. I have a very deep concern for the philosophical, uh, psychological uh, impact that it would have on on an individual living um, in a high-rise building. Uh, I'm, I'm a lot more concerned about it than, than Ken is because he lives in an apartment, so he's used to it. Uh, but I don't. have you ever visited uh, Kenneth King's apartment in New York? Yes, I have. Mm-hmm. Well, well, he lives in an atypical, somewhat atypical apartment because he has that roof terrace that he overlooks, and and um, if it's well maintained, it's quite it's quite beautiful. Uh, but you need to live in in in, in somewhat isolation, high up, uh, where your your flexibility is quite limited, um, to begin to understand this concern that people would have in living in a high rise building. Uh, this why this is why. Later on in one of the questions, I, uh, I try to point that out. Okay. I, I definitely have heard other people echo that concern. And, and like you, I grew up in a very rural area. Uh, so I'm, I'm very comfortable in nature. But I've also, over time, become more comfortable in big cities. And I, I love cities. I'm currently in Shanghai, and I've spent some time in New York. And I love the density, and I actually quite enjoy being up in high places because of the views it provides. So I guess it just the answer is that vertical city model is obviously not going to be for everybody. Uh, that's true. However, in a congested country like China, you may not have any choices. Yeah, that's also and true. So, yeah, so as designers and architects, we really need to be concerned about these issues. Uh, we can't sidestep them or put them aside because they're real. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the... Uh, the people that we interviewed was uh, the person in charge of uh, designing of housing uh, for, for Singapore, Liu Tai Ker. Mm-hmm. He actually wrote the preface to the book. Uh, and he was very, very concerned about uh, going too far afield concerning high rise living uh, for fear that it, it may be read incorrectly by his fellow Singaporeans. When he was in charge of uh, uh, Designing uh, new cities and, and, and new apartments for the country of Singapore, he actually had on his staff sociologists whose whose task was to uh, examine the very issues that uh, you and I have just mentioned uh, to to make sure that uh, there were some means of giving comfort uh, to those people who have these concerns. Uh, one of the main things he found out was that. Since you are in a high-rise building, the, the elevator has to be uh, in perfect shape all the time. Oh, okay. So there's a lot of preventive maintenance that took place uh, beyond what the manufacturer will recommend. Uh, 
uh, and they have security cameras that, to make sure that uh, there's no hanky panky going on, and certainly that the elevators uh, where you're isolated with strangers are perfectly safe. Uh, and so those are the things that uh, you know a lot of people worry about if they're not used to it. My wife, for instance, Donna, uh, because she's had some bad experiences of elevators stopping mid floor, uh, would not go into an elevator by herself. Wow. So if we extend that concern, uh, uh, my main one is the long corridors so that are inevitable and the configuration of the apartments themselves. Uh, my my way of thinking is that, uh, if, if possible, these uh, apartments should actually extend from one surface to the other. In other words, you will have a hallway, a public hallway, sort of between uh, your apartment. You'll have a, a, a dual-level uh, floor plan so that you would have that vertical change that, that I think is so essential, uh, even uh, terraces per apartment so you can have a, a bit of horizontality, uh, not to mention the fact that it would give you cross-ventilation, which is badly needed in, 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 in most cases. Okay. I think that definitely all makes sense. D- does, in your opinion, does the do the outdoor sky bridges – do they help to alleviate some of the concerns that people have around being in a totally vertical structure? Definitely. Uh, but let's keep in mind that a majority of the occupants, their whole lifestyle would be one within their own apartment. And so the whole process of, of what happens when they leave their apartment uh, to get to the elevator I'm not at all worried about the sky lobbies. I think they, they'd be very interesting, uh, exciting places with a lot of life and so forth and so on. Uh, but it's the whole process of the individual by himself, uh, either late at night or early in the morning, traveling, uh, you know, up and down this long elevator and then long, through these long corridors. So my way of thinking is that, that, uh, we avoid that 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 prison like long walk by having uh perhaps at the end of the corridor uh, uh, a view to the outdoors maybe to a three story high uh, garden of some kind internal garden and then uh with, with these one block long corridors which are inevitable if you are going to go high you would you would also have uh, occasions to look outdoors for relief uh, imagine the difference between, let's say you have uh, 40 or 50 apartments. I'm exaggerating just for the sake of, of comparison. Okay. You walk down this long corridor, and you've been there before in, in, in hotels and motels, and if they're not designed correctly, it is extremely boring. Yeah. And if they're dimly lit, uh, it's kind of scary. However, if you were to compare that to a, a regular city, Street, even though they may be very narrow, uh, Europe being a, a good example, there's variety. Uh, there's verticality, there are terraces, there are flowers, uh, there's a lot of life, the change in the pavement, change in height, uh, people sitting on their stoops or waving from the balconies. You know, that's quite different from a deadly dark corridor. So my, my, if I were designing uh, a, a real uh, vertical city, I would put a lot of concentration and effort uh, in that one element, which I think is unique uh, in a in a high rise building. Yeah, it once seems you get like... into an apartment, that's something else. Mm, okay, it seems like there would be a couple fairly easy ways to address that, at least that are coming to mind immediately for me. One being creating corridors that are multiple stories or that vary in story height, so that mm-hmm. you're not always enclosed by a ten or twelve foot. Uh, ceiling. And I also think it would be really interesting to, if you had one side of the corridor that was totally open uh, with windows that, so basically you're looking to the outside the entire time that you're walking through that corridor. I think that would be very nice. You you absolutely need to do that. So, you know, that's a a fairly fundamental way of doing it and how you treat the doorways and, and, and all of that, that all comes into play. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So, after you've written this book, how do you personally define what a vertical city is? Well, that means that we'll have to sort of 
define exactly what a vertical city is, as you said. Okay, uh, the the most unsustainable and and therefore destructive element of the runaway urbanization is the need for housing. Uh, if you think about it, all suburbs basically provide bedrooms, uh, loosely referred to as a bedroom community. Yeah. Uh, and as a consequence of of urban uh, sprawl, uh, suburbanization in particular, which happens at the outer edge of the building. So it calls for the most uh, elemental uh, solution uh, of providing uh, bedrooms, uh, which we call residence or the R type. Uh, and then there's a second uh, type of vertical city, uh, which is essentially a, a, a new single-purpose city. Now, I say single-purpose because single-purpose building has limitations. It has uh, accurate projections. Uh, you can't just assume that you can, in a multi-use, uh, high-rise uh, vertical city, allow just anything to happen. So this is the, the, the certain formulas are, are, are needed in order for you to uh, successfully create a vertical city. So if it's a mixed-use vertical city, which we could refer to as a live-work city, it really uh, is better if you have a, a single-purpose need, uh, such as that for uh, let's say Silicon Valley uh, or a college town or a medical research center, or even an office park, or in, in, as in the case of, uh, of China, maybe a, a definable governmental department. Uh, think about the Pentagon, for instance. The Pentagon in Washington, D.C. Uh, would be a perfect requirement of a vertical city, a single-purpose vertical city. You have all the requirements of, of the Pentagon needed in the podium and the lower building, and the residence would be in the high-rise tower. Okay. And, and so these are the cities that supply employment to the majority of its residents. Uh, these we refer we, we refer to these as the live work or LW vertical cities. So common common to both the residential and the live work vertical cities uh, are the non residential functions, uh, which are necessary to support the day to day needs. Uh, these would be located in the sky lobbies, uh, in each of the residential towers. And there will be several sky lobbies at the transfer floors, as we discussed before. And these uh, sky lobbies would be similar to uh, the centers of any town or, or, or city, where you have shops of food, clothing, uh, hardware, drugstores, bars, and restaurants. Uh, and also post offices in the laundry, beauty parlors, uh, daycare centers, uh, even medical and dental uh, and law offices. And even perhaps uh, some local governmental branches such as the police, so forth. Uh, and these we refer to as the the non-resident or non-residential function, the NR function. And also common to both of the vertical cities are the additional non-residential functions serving uh, also the local residents that are too large uh, or, or too uh, specialized to be located within the sky lobbies, uh, such as one ser serving large populations uh, like the schools, for instance. And their uh, related functions of requiring column free long span spaces, uh, such as for the lecture halls, the auditorium, and gyms. Uh, other uh, uses, such as for cinemas, or theaters, or opera houses, bowling alleys, and department stores, hospitals, or, or art gallery. And even governmental functions, such as courthouses and fire departments, or even for uh, offices and hotels. Those are housed in the separate low rise buildings. Uh, clustering around the towers uh, and on on the podium. Yeah. Finally, the larger uh, live work vertical cities are for employment providing functions, such as for, as I said before, campuses, uh, requirements of the university, uh, or uh, medical uh, facilities for patients, such as the hospital, uh, or even for uh, light clean manufacturing facilities uh, or a research center. Uh, or a self-contained branch of the government. And these uh, would be located uh, in separate low or medium uh, rise building, also sitting on the podium and supporting the vertical towers. All of the vertical cities are designed to function without the need uh, for privately owned cars. 
and the raised platform or the level is a of the walkable, pedestrian only, car free platform, uh, where the main entrances of the buildings of the towers and the lower buildings are located. The small footprint of the podium, a maximum uh, edge to edge distance of a half a mile, uh, which we determined as being able to be negotiated easily by a comfortable 15 mile walk. And I, when I was work, uh, working in the city, I did that every every morning and every evening from the station to to my office. So you combine that with the various vertical towers, that serve as a key land-saving elements of the vertical city. Mm-hmm. Uh, below the podium deck uh, just described all the mechanical services uh, for the city for ease of operation and maintenance. And another floor down is what we call grade or ground uh, for deliveries and the vehicular entrance um, and parking uh, to reach the building lobbies at the podium level. So that basically describes the elements of the, of the vertical city. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, mm-hmm. And it sounded like you had said 15 miles, but I know that you meant 15-minute walk. Just 15 to, minutes. Yeah, 15 minutes. I just wanted to correct that for any listeners who, who might have... 15, a 15 minute, a, a leisure 15-minute walk. Right now in New York City, I think that's been clocked like three miles an hour, some such thing, uh, because you know if you negotiate the city of New York, what you try to do is the uh, avoid the time-consuming wait for the light to change. Sure. So you you time your pace to hit the intersection when the light is green. Oh yeah, that makes sense. And and that's why New Yorkers are noted for being the fastest walkers in the world. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Got to hurry up and catch the light. So as you talk with others about the vertical city concept, what are some of the main things or the most common things that people tend to misunderstand about this concept? Well, the term vertical city, of course, it's, uh, it, it is not commonly used. You know, when you talk about vertical city, people almost automatically uh, think that it's an office tower. Okay. Uh, and if you're Singaporean, <laughs> you would know that almost everything is vertical. We did a lot of work in Singapore. And so office buildings, hotels, uh, anything that's repetitive uh, can be located uh, comfortably in a vertical tower. Now, to, to answer your question as to what people don't understand about vertical towers, I, I can only speak for my fellow Americans. Okay. Uh, that the American dream of owning a, a one's own home uh, within a patch of lawn and surrounded by a white picket fence. It was valid when clearing land for a college uh, by falling a few trees did relatively little damage to the balance of the forces of nature. But if you increase the same activity by two, 320 million times the population of America uh, with a corresponding increase uh, in the need for the infrastructure, in, infrastructure and the cost of transportation and the increase of, of uh, pollution that approach is no longer sustainable. And it's actually uh, the cost of becoming so unaffordable by the, uh, by the average American working family. So a drastic change uh, from dream to reality calls for an urgently needed solution. Uh, so therefore, short of reducing the population, uh, one sustainable solution is the vertical city. I'm somewhat repeating myself now, but having been raised in the open plantation farmland of Mississippi and experiencing living in the basement of an apartment in New York City to an attached townhouse and from there to a single-family home of my own design, uh, which was the American dream, uh, I know that I would find apartment living uh, within a congested city claustrophobic and stifling. So for me... Uh, as for an example, living in a city in a small apartment reached by long, dark corridors after a long ride in an elevator all needs to be considered in order to take steps to ease my built-in uh, opposition to such a drastic change in my lifestyle. Yeah. Indeed, it was uh, with that in mind that, that I deliberately went beyond uh, a concept to the actual examination of the very issues uh, which I just articulated. It's an effort to increase the chance that if life in a vertical city is inevitable, then let, let's at least make sure that it's also viable and rewarding. Absolutely. Do you feel that the development of vertical cities is inevitable? Is this going to happen um, somewhere anytime soon? And if so, where? The, 
the building of a, a building, unlike uh, the production of cars or an airplane, there are no production prototypes. Uh, for instance, uh, whatever whatever cause it takes, um, manufacturers would first build a, a prototype to test out not only the design but the whole process of manufacturing. Uh, that's not possible in buildings. So it, it's therefore uh, essential that an actual vertical city be built. But in my mind, it's not necessary for the prototype to be a mile high. Sure. It would be roughly 400 floors. Actually, to test the ropeless elevators, uh, which can exceed the current maximum heights reached by uh, uh, conventional elevators, 100 floors, all you really need is build a, a, a building that's somewhat taller than that. And I would say, say 250 stories uh, or 300 floors, not necessarily 400. Uh, with a building of that high, you can also put to test the whole concept of the sky lobby and maybe even the sky bridges. Uh, so as far as the where, I think China is a perfect place for it. Within currently uh, within the planned mega city of Beijing, Tianjin, in the province of Hebei, otherwise known as the Three J's, there is such a need. And let me here paraphrase uh, an executive summary of a paper that Janet Adams and I are now currently prepared for use by Kenneth King. Okay. Here I'm quoting. In April of 2015, the Chinese government approved plans to integrate Beijing, Tianjin, and the surrounding Hebei province into one vast mega city stretching over 216,000 square kilometers, which is roughly 83 square miles. And, and uh, uh, then it's actually comparable to the distance from New York to Philadelphia. It's amazing. Yeah, uh, with a projected population of 130 million, which is equal to about one third of the whole population of the United States in that one mega city. So combined, that would combine China's cultural and governmental capital with one of the country's largest cities and ports, and also one of the most important industrial zones. So I believe that that China is a perfect testing ground for 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 uh, such a vertical city. So I think we're proven to build a self-contained, self-sustained uh, bedroom community for anywhere from a population of uh, 250,000, which is my uh, realistic number, compared to a Ken who wants anywhere from 300 to 500,000 uh, in view of the population requirements of China. Sure. Uh, it would illustrate to the world the, the broad vision of the Chinese government to help solve one of the world's most pressing problems. And by testing the, the, the validity of the principles of vertical city as a solution for sustainable living for an ever-expanding population. So I think China is, uh, has a perfect opportunity and, and frankly, the need uh, for such. And, yeah. and, and Kenneth King, as I understand it, is, 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 will, will try very hard to convince uh, Beijing to examine the possibilities of a vertical city uh, as a solution to preserving uh, scarce land and to serve to 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 serve the uh, the growing population. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you give me the two choices of living in a city that stretches from New York to Philadelphia or living in a vertical city, then I'm definitely going to choose the vertical city because I would like to be able to access nature without having to travel more than an hour to get there. Currently in Beijing. If you try to travel from one side of the city to the other, and I, I did this some, sometime last year, I was in a taxi for over an hour. And it seems like that's going to just escalate and become even more dramatic if they complete this project that they're proposing. Right. You know, the, the, well, we're not equipped. I don't know that anyone is equipped to, to try to help guide the physical shape of this mega city. Some of it's going to happen on its own anyway by market forces. Yeah. One thing that we learn uh, from working in the pay office is that you can only create very broad, with a very broad brush, uh, certain principles uh, of pattern and growth uh, and transportation network 
because sure as hell, market forces will change. Mentality will change. Uh, uh, wishes and desires uh, and abilities will change. So all you can do is, is, is help guide it. You, you can't uh, you, you can't draw hard lines on a piece of paper and expect it to uh, to to meet uh, reality. And, and so, but if you have a visionary government and you have the will and the determination, which all of what China has, then a vertical city would be very vertical city, as a matter of fact, would be very possible in China, and and would help to uh, preserve the scarce land that 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 China has. Yeah, that seems to be um, extremely important. Their, most of their most arable land is on the eastern seaboard, and not most of it, but a significant amount of it is. And that's also where all the development is happening. So you're literally just laying asphalt and cement over some of the most precious available land that they have. Right, right. Once you do that, you cannot reclaim it. it I, I know of very few places where someone would come along and say, look, let's Let's take the paving, remove the paving. You yeah. Know, even abandoned airfields, no one has the where to all the money to pick up the concrete or or, or, or the tarmac. Oh, that's interesting. And so you, you leave it, you leave it to nature, and by God, you know, in time, plants will grow and eventually concrete will will, will crumble. But that takes centuries. To, Absolutely. To do. Yeah. And particularly with the reinforcing steel in it, you know, oh, it, yeah. it just doesn't happen. Yeah, that's. That's a shame. The Bannon Airfields, I had never thought of that before, but that's, that is absolutely a shame. I mean, that's, that's land that could have so many other purposes, but it's going to just sit there, like you said, for centuries, more than likely until nature reclaims it. You know what we, you, you, you touched on a subject uh, that your own desire would be, would prefer to be in, in a vertical city uh, so you can reach nature quite quickly. We really haven't described that because in uh, the small footprint uh, for the, platform and the building themselves allows you deliberately to establish as a a constraint as to how close, how frequently you can have this sort of the city by determining uh, if, you're, if you're working at open land to begin with, how much land do you need surrounding each vertical city for the growing of Vegetables. You can't grow all kinds of crops. Uh, the, the the badly needed vegetables can be grown 24 hours a day in the land that you save. Yeah. Uh, in the land that you save would also, the farms, by the way, uh, and I'm trying to come up with a term for it, there would be park farms. In other words, uh, to to reach the, the, the each of the plots, you really need paths and roadways. These paths would be tree line, so that the obviously the 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 fields when they're green are, are attractive, but when they're not, then they're not. But in order to provide park open space for walking and hiking and, and and so forth, we need to come up with a solution where park like spaces, even forest clusters of trees and orchards and so forth, will be intermingled with the farmland so that it serves a dual purpose. It's park and recreation for the residents with sufficient open space for growing of, of, of vegetables and produce to support the that particular vertical city. That, that makes a lot of sense to me, and I think that advocates of permaculture would also support that idea. Exactly, right. Excellent. This has been a great conversation. Um, I want to ask you just a couple more quick questions here with the remaining time that we have. First, mm -hmm. given everything that you've learned and experienced throughout your life, what is your biggest hope for humanity? <laughs> well, if I were more cynical or pessimistic than I am, because I, I really am that way, and with no responsibility to my children or my grandchildren, whom I dearly love and cherish, I would vote for the robots. <laughs> okay. Okay, because they're fast becoming smarter than we individuals. They're more fit and, and can take wear and tear better than man and will soon be able to perform most tasks from housework to building and driving of cars to diagnosing, predicting, and treating of illnesses and even maybe to performing brain surgery. Wow. 
So what happens then? That leaves humans to do what? <laughs> That's a question that is just around the corner, and it demands an answer within a very short one or two generations, say by the time of my grandchildren's children. Sure. That I will leave to the future to answer. I have no idea. It's frightening to think that that human beings will have nothing to do because it's taken over by the robots. So what conclusion can, can one draw if you uh, listen to the political rhetoric here in the United States when a full one-half of the supposedly enlightened population believes that global warming is a political ploy used by the opposition to further expand the interference of the federal government with private enterprise? If you continue to look down at your feet in ignorance instead of at the horizon of enlightenment, you continue to cut down every tree, to pave over every square inch of grassland, to dam up the rivers, to discharge chemicals into our drinking water, to mindlessly burn fossil fuel, to continue to spew out CO2 in the air, you deplete the protective ozone layer, cut off the oxygen, you sniff out the lives of every butterfly, songbird, a cheetah and gazelle, and perhaps man himself, Man, within the very short time that he has walked on two feet, will be responsible within the entire history of the Earth for the sixth major extension, whereas the previous five were spaced tens to hundreds of millions of years apart, including the one caused by the impact of an asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs who inhabited the Earth for millions of years. The upcoming major extension would have been caused by the Earth's most destructive and uncaring creature within 200,000 years. If you continue on that path, the forces of Mother Nature, with the wisdom of the cosmos, would take over and revert all to the ooze of the swamp from which life originally came. And in time, would start all over again. Except this time, a new man perhaps will have a larger brain with which to think more correctly, and maybe with three eyes, two in front to see into the future, and one in the back of his head hmm. to let to learn from the past. Wow. <laughs> that was Or my my hope is that the that the enlightened leaders and followers alike will beginning now, before it's too late, substitute the me, that is what is it in what's in it for me, with the we for the common good. And be, co- be cognizant of all that we have and what is needed and how to achieve them. Our food, clothing, shelter, and lifestyle. Start by consuming and using only what is absolutely necessary. Avoiding things and objects whose gratification is only possession. Take less from the land, thereby reducing the carbon footprint in the manufacturing, shipping, and distribution. Keller, those are very powerful statements. You nearly brought me to tears. I, I feel quite moved by everything you've just said. And I think that you've touched upon um, the most important issues that humanity faces. Um, sounds like you've pretty much already answered this next question that I'm about to ask, but in case there's anything else you want to elaborate on, do you have any advice for our listeners or call to action that you'd like to make for what we as individuals can do to create a better future? Well, it's presumptuous of me to believe that I can add to what the world's most noted philosophers, teachers, and religious leaders have tried in vain for centuries to overcome. Man's inhumanity to man. When the golden root appears trite, when an eye for an eye supplants turning the other cheek, when having the right of way takes precedence over common courtesy, when torture is condoned, do I... Dare think that anyone is listening when I say it, be vigilant, be discerning, be empathetic, and as difficult as it may seem, try forgiveness, and dare I say it, compassion. As for man's rape of nature, to strive for a better future will help guarantee the future. Continue on our present, present path will not only result in the worst future, it will inevitably result in no future. Okay. (laughs) All right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 
I'm an optimist personally, and I, I think we're going to figure it out. But um, well, you have to be. You're younger than me, <laughs> okay? and 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 the future does rest with the young, and they need to know, you know, one's life experience and the lessons learned. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to say that unlike past generations that can chisel on their tombstone, I'm happy to be able to say that I left the world a better place than I found it. I cannot say that. My generation, uh, not me individually, uh, and the generation that follow, have, and I use the word, rake the earth, care, not caring what resources were being depleted, not caring how much carbon dioxide we're producing, and worrying only by self. And so we, we really have to change that mentality to look beyond ourselves and be thinking about others. Yeah, I agree. I think that that's a, a very powerful and appropriate call to action to have made. Kellogg, thank you so much for joining oh, me. You're on. welcome. Yeah, All I right. really appreciate you joining me on the Vertical City Podcast. Um, for our listeners, links and show notes can be found by visiting verticalcity.org slash podcast. And once again, Kellogg, I thank you a lot for joining us. Okay. All yeah. right. Thank you for listening to this episode of Vertical City. Learn more about the Vertical City concept and continue the conversation by visiting our website, verticalcity.org. I truly hope that you've enjoyed this episode. If you did, please subscribe to our podcast, leave a review on iTunes, and most importantly, share Vertical City with your friends and colleagues so that together we can create solutions for sustainable living. I'm Lennon Richardson, signing off for the Vertical City team. See you next time.